evening, every, everybody. First, I would like to, to thank ISOR, the research group in sociology of religion, based at the uh, Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, for inviting me to moderate this uh, conference. Uh, so this conference is organized in the framework of uh, Religions de la Ciutat, a cycle of conferences founded by Fundación, Fundación La Caixa and dealing with the role of religion in European cities. So um, it, it deals more specifically in this case with violent extremism and radicalization, as some of you uh, may have seen in the title. So as most of you may know, we have seen in the past five years a significant number of programs, initiatives and policies aimed at tackling radicalization and violent extremism. Although there is no doubt that violent extremism is a threat, and sadly we can see it in the news uh, almost every month, um, addressing such a threat may be counterproductive in the short or in the long run. And the news uh, coming from France or from Austria, for instance, uh, provide telling examples of that. So almost two months ago, uh, on the 16th of October, Samuel Paty, uh, who was a teacher uh, at, at high school, has been beheaded in a small town near, uh, near Paris. The author of the assassination was only 18. And uh, as he, he, he wrote in, in, in Twitter, uh, that he claimed to have punished what he called one of the, dog, uh, one of the dogs from, from hell. That is to say, a teacher who actually was accused of mocking the Prophet Muhammad. Although uh, this attack has not uh, aimed at killing a massive number of people, it has had uh, the, the symbol targeted uh, the so-called French Republican School, which is one of the few places where youngsters can address sensitive issues uh, such as freedom of speech or religion. So the fact that schools have been uh, targeted has created an unprecedented shock, um, not, not only in France, but also uh, in Europe in, in general. And this attack actually, what is even more shocking is the fact that this attack came two weeks after uh, the attempt made by a young man to kill journalists from Charlie Hebdo. And it happened two weeks uh, before another terrorist attack was perpetrated again in France uh, when a young man entered the church in Nice and killed three people. All these attacks have actually a common denominator. They came after Charlie Hebdo decided to republish the caricature of the prophet of Islam and that was in early September. But to this common denominator, we should add uh, maybe three points that I would like to share with you. Uh, the first has to do with the fact that the three perpetrators here uh, were identified both as Muslims and as migrants, uh, because most of them have come to France uh, only a couple of years earlier or even a couple of hours earlier in the case of uh, the latest perpetrator. The second point, and, and this is something quite concerning, none of them actually uh, claim this as being a terrorist attack. None of them uh, made reference to ISIS or Al-Qaeda or any terrorist organization, and no terrorist organization claimed responsibility for the attacks. And this has led some people in public opinion to say that uh, migrants in particular, but Muslims in Europe in general, may have some problems with freedom of speech, with uh, the so-called French Republican values, et cetera, et cetera. And the third point, which is, I think, the most important, and, and it will be the point on which I think our speaker today will focus, uh, has to do with the reaction to these terrorist attacks uh, by the French government, but also by the French president. Uh, these reactions are particularly concerning. We have seen Emmanuel Macron saying that he was going to wage war against terrorism. Uh, exactly the same word used by the former president, François Hollande, in 2015. Uh, we have also heard the president saying that uh, we need to make fear uh, to change sides, while the French government has passed just yesterday, actually, uh, a project, a legal project, uh, the so-called law on separatism that specifically targets Muslim communities in France. So what does all that mean? 
does it mean that there is a specific problem uh, within certain segments of the population? Does it mean, I mean, let's be frank, that uh, French Muslim communities are getting radicalized? Or does that mean that we do have a problem in general with uh, freedom of speech? So to answer these questions, uh, I have uh, the pleasure to, to we, we have the pleasure actually to have with us uh, Nadia Fadil. Nadia Fadil is associate professor at the University of Leuven in Belgium. She works at the Interculturalism, Migration and Minorities Research Center, where she earned a PhD. And she has been postdoctoral Jean Monnet Research Fellow at the European University Institute. She has been a visiting fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, a Fulbright visiting fellow at Columbia University, and the FWO postdoctoral fellow at the uh, KU level. So Nadia's work concentrates on Islam in Europe. Um, and here Islam is understood both as a lived tradition and as an object of regulation. Her work focuses on theoretical issues such as subjectivity and power, ethical selfhood, postcoloniality, governmentality, race and secularism. Her most recent publications include Secular Bodies, Effects and Emotions, European Configurations, and Radicalization in Belgium and the Netherlands, Critical Perspectives on Violence and Security. Nadia Fadil has been active as columnist and writer in the Belgian press and is board member for a few organizations working on migration, multiculturalism, and social inequality in Brussels. Nadia uh, has, and uh, I may stress that, uh, has recently published a short piece titled Radical Free Speech that I highly recommend you to read. Uh, and in this piece, Nadia, you wrote, terrorism has become an ideological battleground, which is primarily apprehended in, mor apprehended in moral terms thereby rendering analytical or intellectual reflections on such events difficult. So the challenge maybe for us today is to use this hour for uh, not only your individual, but also a collective reflection on what seems to be a critical moment for uh, the studies that are concerned with radicalization and most crucially with the policies that are uh, supposed to put an end to this phenomenon called violent radicalization. So without delaying you more your intervention, Nadia, uh, thank you again for being with us and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Musa, for this introduction. And I would also like to thank uh, uh, Mar and Victor and Isor, the whole team, uh, for uh, setting this up and also for inviting me to speak. Unfortunately, um, uh, we had been speaking for long about a visit to Barcelona, so we will have to wait. Uh, it will not be for now, but in the meantime, I'm also very happy to, to, to share my work uh, via this medium. So um, I'm going to share my PowerPoint. Hopefully this will, uh, I hope you can see it. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So maybe this is a better way to do it, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so thank you again for, uh, for, uh, for uh, being here. And so uh, the context of the intervention that I want to do today um, and in a sense I will also build on the on the short piece that that, that uh, Musa also referred uh, is quite contentious um, as you have all witnessed uh, in the past few weeks uh, the recent attacks in France have triggered uh, an important wave of reactions on the part of the French state but also more broadly in the public debate but not only we have also seen how in Austria, uh, in the weeks following uh, the Vienna attack in early November, um, a decision was also taken up to legislate and ban any form of uh, political Islam, also accompanied by a set of uh, crackdowns. And in various European countries, including uh, Belgium, the public debate has been quite charged in, in the recent weeks. This, of course, is not a, a new development. Um, ever since the attacks of 2015, the climate around Islam in France and uh, Europe has been highly charged. And before that, we have also seen several years of ongoing uh, debates on the place of Muslims uh, uh, in, uh, and Islam uh, in Europe. But let me return to the events following the decapitation of Samuel Patin Conflant and the attacks in the Basilique de Notre-Dame de Nice 
as they have seen an unprecedented series of interventions by the French state. And I just want to um, uh, name a few of them. So we've seen immediately after the murder of Samuel Paty that searches were organized in more than 50 homes and organizations. And this occurred amongst individuals and organizations who were unrelated to the attack. And this is also uh, by, by the admittance of the Minister of the Interior, Darmanin, but which had as primary aim to harass, and I'm quoting him here also the minister, the Islamist movement in the country. Very shortly after the attack, we have also witnessed the dissolution uh, uh, of um, humanitarian organizations, Baraka City, and also the announced dissolution of anti-racist organizations uh, such as the CCF. Last week, 70 mosques were controlled on their alleged radicalization. And in the recent weeks, we have seen how the debate in France was, um, has moved further as academics and anti-racist activists also saw themselves being under attack. In an attempt to regulate the academic discourses, senators have attempted to add an amendment to the new uh, law around the funding of higher education, demanding that ad academics should respect uh, uh, Republican values. Now, I would like to briefly pause um, at the, um, at the uh, dismantling of the CCF, which actually the decision was, uh, was officially announced uh, uh, a few days ago. Um, and the CCF is the Collective Contre l'Islamophobie en France that struggles uh, against Islamophobia. Now, the dissolution on itself is, is quite ironic eh, because, in fact, the CCF itself preempted the decision by the French state by dissolving itself. But in its decision to dissolve an already dissolved organization, uh, the French state brought forward a number of important elements that I want to highlight as a way of introduction and also the ground upon which uh, I want to explore, uh, that I want to explore further in this talk. And so as you can see, for those who can read uh, French, I want to focus on, on a particular, I mean, there are different motivations that are given, but one of them is particularly uh, interesting uh, and it continues also in the other uh, justifications. And so one of the first reasons given is uh, considering in the first instance that by qualifying as Islamophobe certain measures taken to prevent terrorism and prevent conduct punished by the law, the Collective Contre l'Islamophobie en France must be seen as sharing, cautioning and contributing to propagate such ideas at the risk of suscitating in turn hate, violence, or discrimination or producing a breeding ground for violent action uh, and amongst uh, its sympathizers. So what we see here is um, what is uh, what, what CCF is basically being charged, that is to um, basically uh, somehow challenge the idea that um, to, to somehow create a climate, a climate of suspicion, a climate of uh, of, 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 of distrust towards the measures taken, uh, the, 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 the French state, and also, um, and that's also what, what it says in conclusion, it aims to somehow scare the Muslim community. So that's, you could say, one of the uh, decisions, the motivations for the decisions. Now, a first way to analyze this uh, particular uh, response, and you could say very, very strong response by the French state, is to uh, understand it somehow as a turn to the right by the French state, huh? um, uh, that is also exacerbated by the electoral presence uh, of the far right in, uh, in France. And we have seen also several, you could say, analysts also arguing in that respect and stating that actually the President Macron, but also the current administration uh, um, uh, with the Prime Minister Ramana is actually really putting itself in a pole position in the competition uh, with the far right. But, um, and this is of course in preparation of the presidential elections uh, in two years. But this development is furthermore also, of course, also strengthened by a growing uh, and rigid view on laicity. And several analysts have also highlighted how this is actually not just a new development, but actually stands in continuity with a growingly rigid view on laicity, which takes the expression of religious practices like the headscarf as a, as a sign of political Islam. So wearing the headscarf or praying at the workplace in these cases are not just seen as expressions of religious piety, but primarily seen as a manifestation uh, of political Islam. And this is of course something that was at the heart also of the law against separatism um, that was announced by Emmanuel Macron uh, a few months earlier. 
where it also sought to express a firm commitment to restore the national cohesion of the Republic that it saw also to be threatened by a number of anti-Republican movements, which were very explicitly also defined as the uh, Islamist movement. They were accused of promoting values that stand in conflict with the Republican values. Now, what is also interesting, and that's of course also something that we might also want to reflect on, is that in the context of France, this gesture and this movement is also often accompanied and supported, not just by, uh, um, you could say, non-Muslim uh, white French uh, actors, but is also very much supported and bolstered by the presence of a legion of uh, public figures from the Maghreb um, who actually also very much support the, this, this shift and this war against what some also call Islamofascism, and using here the word of well-known public figure Zina Bel Razawi, um, or other figures who actually very much uh, have, 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 have lamented the fact that the French state has been quite passive towards this Islamist threat and the fact that it should actually act uh, more fiercely. But there is another element that I want to highlight um, in this particular development. And this not only attends to the French model of laïcité, which has been largely commented upon and how it has radicalized in, in the last two decades, but I also want to uh, reflect on how this development has also become increasingly entangled with a growing concern with radicalization and national security. So what I want to basically uh, highlight in the coming uh, minutes that I have, I, I want to suggest that the current backlash on free speech which accuses academics, anti-racist activists and journalists, but also of course, uh, Muslim organizations of complicity with uh, terrorists is one of the resulting consequences of a dominant view that sees terrorism as the, as the result of a process of radicalization and polarization which is seen to be provoked by uh, cultural and religious diversity and the lack of assimilation to secular values. And so in what, I, what follows, I want to briefly pause at this notion of radicalization and also how it has enabled actually a broadening of the scope of surveillance and policing that are generally defined as the comprehensive approach. One of the more important hallmarks of this shift I want to show is that it not only attends to the presence of organizations that might be potentially disruptive and dangerous, but it equally implies a redefinition of social dynamics, movements, and public interventions as potentially instigating and disrupting the public order. And I want to argue that the recent events in France are the, to be situated in the line of the further expansion of this comprehensive approach, um, and that it not only restricts itself uh, to Islamic organization, but as we have seen in the last weeks, has also increasingly uh, expanded itself to activists and academic discourses that critically challenge Islamophobia and racism. And so I want to reflect on this and how the prevention of radicalization equally implies the transformation of particular types of public interventions into radical speech. Now, when I talk about uh, the language of radicalization, and as you see, I don't talk about the process of radicalization, I'm more interested in how this notion came to be introduced in our public imaginary and also the functionality of this, not just language, but also what we describe uh, with, together with Martin de Koning and Francesco Ragazzi in our book, uh, Dispositif in the sense of Foucault as in the kind of apparatus. Um, and so uh, by using that word, I refer also, uh, I mean that uh, in this notion of radicalization, there is a coming together of a particular uh, definition of a problem, the problem of radicalization, but also a series of experts, security experts, scholars, um, political interventions, policy making, and so on and so forth, that uh, all come together around this shared new problem that is defined, and that is the problem of radicalization. And so when the language of, or this idea or this notion or the discourse, if I can use that, that word, I continue with that word, uh, was introduced of radicalization in Europe, it was the result of a desire by the security services to find an adequate language to capture the growing tensions that they linked with the multicultural composition of their societies. So in our book, uh, we try to offer a close analysis of how this notion um, was introduced by the security services in the Netherlands in 2001, to be later adopted by countries like the UK through the prevent model and later overall uh, in Europe. 
And in its introduction, it became introduced as a way to capture the relationship between the problem of integration that was already waging in the 90s, which was increasingly diagnosed as a domestic preoccupation and international terrorism. So we describe in our book how uh, this transition has occurred uh, from the second half of the 90s um, and also reflected in an increasing concern with Islamic organizations and shift occurs around uh, 95, 96. And this shift uh, within the security services echoes another more important element around the same period in the Netherlands, that is the understanding that the problem of that the, the growing idea or discourse or debate around the problem of integration of socio-cultural uh, minorities. And what we show also in our book is how actually it is with an explicit reference to this integration problematic that already existed in the early 90s, I mean, it was thematized in the early 90s. We often forget that the Netherlands was actually was were one of the forerunners in talking about the problem of integration, in thematizing also the problem of integration, and in saying that multiculturalism has failed. And actually, what we see is that the, the, the security services, uh, in that case, the Binance uh, Valley Heads, the Insta, actually considered it their own task to also do something about integration. Integration until then was treated as a social problem, as a social question that was treated by a ministry of integration. And what we see from the second half of the 90s is that the intelligence services and security services are increasingly saying, well, maybe we should change the scope of our operation. So far, we have focused on following specific militant groups and organizations that we consider to be potentially threatening. And for instance, we describe also how in the early period, in the early 90s, they're following specific organizations like the PKK or so listing also in the year reports, very specific targeted uh, organizations. And what we see from the second half of the 90s is a shift from a focus on organizations to a focus on cultural groups. And so this shift, of course, corresponds with this changing discourse around integration and also the increasing, you could say, preoccupation by the security services that they maybe should also do something uh, about integration. And so the main task of the uh, security services that they would give themselves is not to examine the failing process of integration, because they understand that to be a competence of social policies, but to also identify and monitor the carriers who are understood to potentially hinder the integration process. And so as a result, Islamic organizations are seen to emerge as potentially promoters of anti-integrationist speech and positions that could potentially also represent a threat on the long term. Attention will therefore be given to document, Report and identify actors or groups who could be seen as limiting a successful integration process. Now, when the term radicalization will be introduced in, 2000, in the year report of 2001, uh, this will occur at a moment where the security services try to expand their reach. And that's what they also call the comprehensive approach by drawing a link between security and integration. And so, and this link was already uh, made, huh? so that's even before 9-11, but with the concept of radicalization, they want to make this connection more explicit. And this is also from the report where the term becomes introduced uh, for the first time. And you see that uh, it becomes defined and it's actually really interesting to see the shift huh, from the early nineties where the threat assessments are very much focused on specific groups. Here we see, um, you could say, a new uh, language appearing that actually focuses on the breeding grounds for the emergence of radical ideas, the necessity also to sense the general mood, the necessity also to focus on social processes and to also monitor uh, broader developments. And so um, in our book, we offer further an uh, analysis of how this development will occur further. What we will also show is, what we also show is how um, we see a shift from uh, uh, radicalization that is specifically focused on, on the Muslim community in this passage, you see in, even specifically on the Moroccan community to actually a shift on other communities and that will happen after 2004 more or less. And then in the late 2000s, a shift to polarization. So we see also the language changing from radicalization to polarization. 
So more than a decade later, later the idea that radicalization or polarization, as it will be called later, precedes terrorism has become a well-integrated uh, adagium in most European countries since the departure of European Muslims to Syria and the attacks of 2005, 2015 and onwards. This take thereby also enables a new set of inquiries into the root causes of radicalization. So we have a shift from the root causes of terrorism to what are the root causes of radicalization. European states, including France, have thereby treated radical Islam, which is sometimes captured as Salafism. So we see also in the reports of the, uh, of the Dutch uh, intelligence services a focus on Salafism in the early period. In France, we see also a discourse on the Muslim Brotherhood, which is not that present in the Netherlands, um, even though increasingly so actually uh, in the recent uh, years. And so they are increasingly seen as one of the main instigators of the process of radicalization. And so we also see several regional, uh, you could say, variations. Eh? So uh, what is interesting is France is where that we see actually France adopted quite late compared to the Netherlands or Britain, for instance, or even Belgium, uh, a federal policy on radicalization. It was actually one of the latecomers. Uh, it, it, it developed a coherent plan in 2014. Um, whereas Belgium, for instance, adopted its first plan in 20, 2004. Uh, the Netherlands also uh, already in 2001, as I, as I said, prevent also around 24, uh, 2004, 2005. And so this also, of course, has to do with the way in which France understands also itself as a laic Republican country and already identified political Islam as a problem. Eh? So that's not new in France. But what we see also in this new shift is that uh, there is not just a focus on specific groups that are uh, marked as, as political Islam, but also the process before people could even adhere to, 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 to political Islam uh, in the first place. So the, you could say the policies around radicalization have a broader scope uh, in that uh, respect. Um, so now these policies have, have obviously been, been critiqued uh, ever since they, have, they exist. Uh, and, and our take is in a way also a critical perspective, but critical in the sense that we also we try to understand its operation and its functioning and to understand also the presuppositions upon which uh, it draws. And so one of the important points of critique on the policies of radicalization has been the tendency to depoliticize, to psychologize, and to individualize, uh, uh, you could say, the uh, attraction to uh, specific groups. So we no longer take into consideration uh, a, a political or social context, but we primarily focus on certain ideas. Now, in this particular uh, element, uh, there is a specific aspect that I want to pause at. Um, and uh, the element that I want to pause at is how in this new narrative around radicalization, Muslim organizations are accused of being enablers of process of radicalization. So we see, for instance, uh, and that's the case in the analysis of Salafism, for instance, uh, who are being accused of promoting a Mankinian view on society and to polarize society also to promote the sense of victimhood. And that's also something that we find again in the critique on the CCEF, for instance, and actually to produce a specific outlook on the world. And that's what we saw also in, in the critique that the state had on the CCEF. They actually produce a specific view on the world. So Islamic organizations or Muslim organizations are no longer viewed as complex sociological developments that interact with the lived conditions uh, people uh, might live, but they are rather seen as idealistic and dangerous social discourses that produce a specific perspective on the world. And this reading, I want to suggest, is actually a, an interesting interpretative shift that is worth pausing and reflecting at. For we see here how social discourse and critique become stripped from its material considerations and primarily apprehended as idealistic. And I think it's interesting to reflect on this matter more carefully. For what happens through this operation is equally a designation of particular perspective and accounts as conflicting with the social order and uh, the production of what I would argue is radical speech. Now, in making this point, I am building here on an essay by Jadid Butler, who invites us to consider 
censorship, not only through its limiting capacities, but also through its productive abilities. In an essay entitled Ruled Out Vocabularies of the Censor, she invites us to consider not only how res the restrictive capacities of censorship, but also its productive capacities. She writes, censorship is a productive form of power. It is not only primitive, but also formative as well. Censorship seeks to produce subjects according to explicit and implicit norms. And this production of the subject has everything to do with the regulation of speech. By the latter, I mean the regulation of social domains of speakable discourse. Now, building upon this insight and also on the Foucauldian take that informs her work, that uh, one should consider the productive effects of power, I want to suggest that one of the key functionalities of the policies of counter radicalization is not only the restriction of particular types of discourse of conduct, but rather the production, the identification, the assignation of particular social discourses and practices as a danger for the social order. We see it, for instance, in how people learn to identify specific practices, a beard, a headscarf, praying at the workplace, as potentially a sign of radicalization. And we see it also in uh, public discourse. We're no longer invited to consider how and whether a particular discourse relates to material context. These discourses are rather reduced into ideas, worldviews, which produce a distorted outlook on the world and, are, and have no resonance or link with the material context. And this process, one could say, has been quite systematic towards what has come to be described as radical Islam. It is understood as a type of public speech that needs to be primarily comprehended and understood as an inciting speech. Its capacity is to incite people. It is not descriptive, it is incitive, and thus to trigger and produce particular effects. Now, I want to make take a next step because what we have seen in the recent weeks is not just, you could say, a crackdown on, on Islamic organizations, but we have also seen a similar development, but in this case towards journalists and scholars who raised the issue of Islamophobia in France. We saw, for instance, and you might also probably know and remember the critiques and the, how unhappy Emmanuel Macron was when the New York Times was writing about Islamophobia in France, or uh, the way in which uh, Financial Times journalist made in Khan's piece, uh, piece on France and Islamic, separ Islamic separatism was censored, or the piece of Fahrat Khosrow Kavar was also censored uh, from Politico. So these pieces were on the website but have been removed after complaints. So while none of the accused authors suggested that the French state was directly to blame for the attacks, they did situate these attacks against a background of ongoing public debates uh, on Islam in France. In some cases, these charges, however, even went further. And this was the case for well-known uh, uh, journalist and activist uh, Rokaya Diallo, um, whom you might uh, maybe know. So in a recent, uh, you could say, um, public appearance in the Arte uh, show, 28 Minutes, she was accused by uh, writer Pascal Bruckner of having provided ideological weapons for the attackers of Charlie Hebdo. And as you can read uh, in this conversation, so um, he accuses her uh, of doing so. I will just briefly read it. So he says, uh, your status as a woman, Muslim and black makes you privileged and allows you to say things. If I had said those things, more particularly what you said about Charlie Hebdo and which led amongst others to the death of 12 other Charlies. So he refers to a text that she wrote together with other people in 2011. And the framework was uh, a firebomb that exploded uh, in the offices at night uh, of Charlie Hebdo, which made material damages. Um, and uh, which got a lot of attention um, uh, and the authors of the piece uh, critiqued the attention that that uh, attack had received and the complete neglect that other similar attacks and explosions in front of mosques or in cemeteries um, had not received. So they, 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 they challenged the fact that these other acts of violence were not uh, being publicly uh, condemned or uh, publicly uh, brought under the light. 
And so, and so he refers to that text. So um, he says, uh, so he says, yes, your petition in 2011. And she says, it was not a petition, but a text. And none of the texts that I wrote has led to the death of anyone. It is appalling that you can say that. And Bruckner responds, he says, no, it's not appalling. You have with others led to the hate of Charlie Hebdo and weaponed the arms of the killers. And so the discussion went on and Bruckner defended his position, inviting her to take responsibilities for her claims. Um, and in a radio show, he will also repeat his argument and say that words kill. More recently, we have also witnessed an increase in mobilization also on the part of the French state, but also um, uh, by other uh, intellectuals in academic spaces. The framework uh, of that, so I've already referred to the, to the um, uh, piece of legislation that aimed at revising the funding of higher education, la loi de programmation pour la recherche, where parliamentaries at the, attempted to add an amendment that conditions academic freedom to the respect and values of Republican, uh, of the values of the Republic. And more recently, a hundred of uh, French academics cited the claims of French Minister of Education, Jean-Michel Blanquet, who stated that Islamo-Gauchism, Islamo-Gauchism refers to, um, is an often used expression in France, the literal translation is Islamic leftism, and refers to um, uh, people are accused of Islamo-Gauchism when they are seen of being um, allies of pol political Islam, basically. And so he was saying that Islamo-Gauchism was devastating French universities and promoting an intellectual radicality that promotes uh, that that is promoted through decolonial thought and intersectionality, and which has conditioned the killers of Samuel Paty. So it's interesting here that we see that academic scholarship, in this case, perspectives that draw on decoloniality and intersectionality are um, accused of conditioning the, the killer of Samuel Paty. So anti-racist views, including academic ones, are also being charged with instigating hate and polarization and with potentially radicalizing people. This is the argument of Pascal Bruckner, and that argument is also echoed uh, by the French Minister of Education. And so what I want to refer to is how we see actually a continuity, right, between the process that I described earlier vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, radical Islam. We see now also that how academic studies on racism and Islamophobia are not read as descriptive statements about the material and social context, but they are rather understood as ideological assertions about the world. They are understood as producing particular visions on the social world. Like in the case of radical Islam, they are apprehended as idealistic and performative justifications, thus inducing particular moods and motivations and enabling a sense of victimhood and resentment. And that is, of course, what is seen to lie at the basis of the process of radicalization and that could eventually result to terrorism. Now, how should we move uh, forward from here? <laughs> now, and I'm arriving uh, slowly at my conclusion. I think what I'm trying to say here is that I think it's important, um, and I've seen also many colleagues also speaking out against uh, the assault on free speech uh, within academia, but also towards journalists and so on and so forth. And I think it is important for us to understand how this, what we call an assault on free speech, uh, does not stand in isolation, but it's actually part and parcel of a broader development of regulating the domain of public speech, of which the counter radicalization measures and the prevention of polarization and radicalization are an integral part. Um, and so um, an important element there is to also understand how this dispositive also produces particular types of social utterances and public speech into uh, this kind of inciting speech. Important also in that respect is to understand through which uh, the process through which these transformations come to occur. How does public speech in the religious field and also more particularly amongst Muslim minority become transformed into radical Islam? What are the different iterative processes that accompany it? 
And in that respect, it is also important to understand how that process is also entangled with secularism. Uh, because what we often see is that, and that's also again confirmed in the law against separatism, um, that is that a secularized view on religion often preconditions that understanding. We see that um, articulations that do not uh, neatly fall uh, with uh, what we understand to be religion, namely a matter of belief, becomes redefined as uh, political Islam. So there is also a process of redefining not just proper religion, but also redefining political Islam. For instance, uh, praying at the workplace becomes understood as a form of or an, as an expression uh, of political Islam. Um, and linked to that, there is also it is also important to understand how this same process is a curing towards academic scholarship, academic research, when it also and also to the extent that it becomes expressed in the public uh, uh, sphere. What type of academic speech is subjected to this type of resignification? What becomes understood as incitable speech rather than just a descriptive uh, speech? Um, is it uh, critical scholarship? Is it positivistic scholarship? Is it uh, constructivist scholarship, right? What kind of methods, uh, what kind of epistemological approaches are seen to be often charged and accused of, of, of you could say, uh, inciting people to radicalize? So um, I think there is also an epistemological, you could say, um, division underlying these, uh, these processes. So in order to critically challenge the assault on free speech, uh, but also more broadly on mobilization, I would say, that is currently taking place, it will therefore be essential to not simply view it as an attack on academic freedom, but also as part and parcel of a broader development that tends to turn social contestation, whether it's religious or secular, into radical speech. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Nadia. It was uh, it was great, and I I wish we had uh, some more time to listen to to your development. I have a couple of questions um, in my mind, but as I am in the capacity of chair of this uh, conference, I will let people uh, react onto the chat uh, in English or Catalan. Uh, or Castellano as you want, uh, so that I can I can forward you some some questions. So I I have the feeling that we have a quite shy audience today, <laughs> but again um, your your presentation was uh, quite imp impressive. I really appreciated the fact that uh, not only you traced back the history of the concept of radicalization and its use uh, at the European scale. Uh, but also uh, you evidence the fact that uh, this issue goes beyond Muslim communities in Europe and what is at stake is not only um, stigmatizing or further excluding certain segments of the population, but uh, maybe starting with the weakest group, if you allow me to say so, and then trying to, uh, trying to expand these methods to, to other uh, social groups or to other categories such as journalists and, and academics. So I don't know whether we do have people who have some questions or a comment. I really encourage you to, to ask your questions uh, through the chat. Well, why, while we will uh, wait for anybody to, to ask um, a question, um, I wanted to, 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 to ask you uh, one question. And, and again, I really appreciated the way you developed your whole reflection because I think strategically it helps also to, to develop the idea that this is not something that has to do only with Muslims or this is not some, only something called Islamophobia. It has an Islamophobic component, but it's also about uh, using this for further pur purposes in society. Actually, when you were explaining, I mean, when you were tracing back the origins of the use of the concept of violent radicalization, uh, 
I could not be prevented from thinking of this uh, now quite popular uh, academic dispute between Olivier Roy and Gilles Kepel, with Gilles Kepel on the one hand talking about uh, the radicalization of Islam, I mean, telling us that Muslim communities are getting radicalized, and Olivier Roy talking about the Islamization of radicalism. In the end, when you look at what is happening today in France, and as you rightfully underlined, France has been very late in adopting uh, a law or a strategy against radicalization. The first plan was in 2014, and they have adopted, I think, three plans since then. Uh, don't you think when you look at this law on separatism and the government being harsher and harsher against um, what they call radical Islam or, or whatsoever, don't you think that Gilles Kepel's approach to radicalization has actually won uh, the hearts and minds of uh, the French authorities? And if it is the case, I mean, on a more pessimistic way, I would like to ask you, have we lost the battle over the interpretation of what leads to radicalization or not? Um, thank you for your question. It's a big question, <laughs> but, uh, but I think uh, which will force me also to speculate a bit, which is uh, a, a different exercise. Um, but, uh, but I think, uh, I mean, I think what you correctly point out is, of course, I mean, figures like Gilles Kepel, um, actually, if you read what he writes, wrote already, I think in, what was it, was it in 97, Les Banlieues de l'Islam, um, 94, I, I, I don't know by heart when it was published for the first time. Um, I mean, there is actually a very neat continuity, yeah? and it's not that, uh, that, I mean, he already speaks about uh, how uh, these kind of uh, Islamic organizations are producing, in a way, the, the Islamis les espaces, so they, they somehow uh, Islamize the spaces and produce, you could say, a resentment towards uh, the French state and uh, are to a certain extent responsible for, uh, for, uh, for, um, you could say, uh, for breaking the social contract. Eh? So, and that comes, of course, from his, uh, uh, his work on the Muslim. I mean, I think he worked in Egypt before working on France. And he also, uh, you could say, transposed a lecture that he, I mean, a reading that he made of, of, of uh, political Islam uh, into the French context. I think what, what is different maybe is that um, in a way, um, the Olivier Roy, the, 90s um, still believed in, in the capacity of the French state to, 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 to charm, basically, because it was his main critique. Eh? He said, well, actually, the French state has abandoned its citizens. Eh? So it was mostly also a critique on the French state and the fact that it abandoned the banlieues and given a free way to, to other uh, actors to mobilize and to recruit uh, youngsters. Well, I think today's uh, Gilles Kepel uh, is I mean, I haven't, honestly, I must be very, very honest, I haven't read his latest work. I mean, it's also a way to, for my own sanity, sometimes I avoid uh, reading certain people unless I really uh, have to. Um, so I haven't read the details of his uh, latest work, but, uh, but I think um, um, I'm not gonna talk about Gilles Kepel as such, but I do think that that kind of perspective that uh, there are, um, you could say, um, that Islamist movements are the seed, you could say, of, of, of danger. So we're not even talking about the socioeconomic circumstances anymore. We're just talking about the ideological potential of the seeds of danger that was still present in Kepel's early work. Yeah? So I don't know about the latest work. Um, and his recommendation also in his earlier work was we should invest in the banlieues, we should keep the youngsters uh, with us. I think that has disappeared to a certain extent, right? And that we see actually much more focus on the ideological work uh, of these groups eh? and that these groups are just purely ideological and that the way to protect our uh, a further expansion, you could say, is by protecting, uh, is by, by, by banning and dissolving and, uh, and banning these kinds of organizations. So we're not talking about investing in the values, we're talking about banning. Uh, organizations. So I think, I mean, that would be my immediate answer to you. Um, so I think that the socioeconomic dimension that was still present to a certain extent has disappeared a bit uh, into the background. 
and what has remained is really a sustained focus uh, on, on, on the idea that particular ideologies uh, produce uh, specific attitudes. And I think it, it goes really, it's very well illustrated, I think, in the motivations given to banning the CCEF. At no moment does the French state maybe, I mean, I mean, reflect on the idea that actually people are <laughs> victims of Islamophobia and that there is a reality out there, right? No, it's all about a, a particular idea, a mentality, an attitude that is being promoted and that is being sustained. So the whole context is in a way evacuated. And I think, I think, yeah, that's that's actually a, a next step. And I would even say, well, actually, it's, I mean, I mean, that's I think the most concerning step because. Uh, in many uh, theories on radicalization also that we have documented for our research and that we've read, I've read many studies on radicalization, mostly in the Netherlands and Belgium, you always see that there is still a connection with the material circumstances, right? And the uh, socioeconomic context, experiences of discrimination uh, are also part of the dispositive, right? And a part of the language. And what we see in these recent developments is, is actually somehow an abandonment of, of, of those of those material considerations and I think that's that's an interesting uh, uh, development thank you so much uh, for your answer um, I would like to, to to share here a question from uh, Maria del Mar Griera who says uh, thanks a lot Nadia very interesting you work very well developed this genealogy genealogy of the concept of radicalization and she asks, to what extent this genealogy might uh, is built in between the politics against sects in the 80s and the politics against political leftist radical parties? And do you think that the European debate would be different if France and the imaginaries of laicity would not play this central role? Uh, I don't know if you prefer to answer question by question or do you want me to group questions? What do you prefer? Um, well, I think, um, I think uh, an imaginaries of laicity would not play a, a central role. I mean, I think, I, I think there are two questions in the, the first one is what kind of continuities do we see between the politics against sects and uh, politics against political leftism and radical parties? I mean, I think there again, it's a, I mean, regarding the second one, the political leftist uh, radical parties, I think it's a, case per case approach, because I do think that, for instance, in the context of Germany, the way the far left has been dealt with and treated is not the same as in Belgium and is not the same as in Spain. So I think uh, the, the policies towards the far left actually, uh, I think it, for me, it would be interesting to, to learn more about, about the Spanish context, for instance, or the, the, the German context to understand, because of course, there, there are very clear links also between uh, counter radicalization and also uh, in, in, in Germany, also with the whole Bader Meinhof uh, attacks that have occurred and the desire also to identify, you could say, broader uh, causes that this comprehensive approach that was already present also in the German uh, context, but that has not been pushed further. Um, and the politics against sex, I think, is interesting because indeed uh, around the 80s and the 90s, we see in various European countries, in Belgium also, we see commissions around sects that are being created and also laws around sects that are being created. And actually that, that perspective of sectarianism is also adopted in the country in various, uh, you could say, um, uh, models or, 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 or methods to understand how radicalization works. So we see, for instance, the logic of the recruiter, the logic of brainwashing, uh, the logic of, 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 of you could say, um, yeah, of, of, of ideologically, you could say, feeding someone's uh, head. And so, and the movements are also called sectarian. Eh? So we all often use the same terminology also. So I think there you can actually see uh, a direct uh, uh, link, um, but it's actually interesting that in the reports that we examined for the Netherlands, and I'm not talking about Belgium, I think Belgium would probably be a, a different case, uh, but in the Netherlands in the early nineties, 
uh, there is not a sustained focus on sects in, uh, in the intelligence uh, reports. The focus is more on fundamentalism, but then it's often understood uh, from a foreign um, affairs perspective. So they talk about Iraq, they talk about uh, Iranian uh, groups that could uh, possibly also uh, represent uh, a threat uh, for the order, but it's often read through the international uh, uh, lens. That's the same with the GIA and the FIS, uh, in the 90s, they're not seen as a threat for the Netherlands, they're seen as something that is specific to Algeria and France, and they're not seen as, as, as a threat for, for Europe as a whole. And that uh, changes with radicalization, uh, because with radicalization, we have actually, the focus is not on organizations, but the focus is on integration and the problem of integration. And so from the moment you have a problem of integration, you could potentially have a problem of radicalization. To come to your second question, um, the European debate uh, and France. Well, I think actually in our book we show that actually the language of radicalization emerged in the Netherlands and 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 was actually further, you could say, fomented and fed. Um, of course, I mean Germany also played a role, but the Netherlands was really an important. Uh, exporter, you could say, of, of, of their model uh, to the UK, for instance, that the prevent model was largely inspired by the Dutch uh, approach. And what is interesting is that you see a tension between social democratic, uh, I would say maybe social welfare-ish kind of approach, Nordic uh, approach, right? It's also not a coincidence, I think, that countries like Denmark uh, also quickly adopted uh, these policies. Um, and France, that is much more a state-centric approach. Um, and so where it's much more about uh, the threat of the state, and that's why the focus, I, I mean, that here I'm again, it is our hypothesis, eh? but I would argue that um, um, France kept a focus on political Islam that it saw as an enemy of the state, right? It was a much more state-centric approach. So it was less a social cohesion approach, while in the Netherlands, you had a much more sustained development and concern with social cohesion and social fragmentation. And uh, while in France, they are often very much tied with the integrity of the state, as you also explained, Moussa, that is embodied by, by the school and uh, the Republican value. So it's very much the integrity of the state that is at stake. Um, so, so I would argue that that France comes actually quite late to to the party, but but uh, manages to catch up very quickly, <laughs> if you want. And uh, and and in a way, yes, absolutely. I think the, the 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 position of France on the combination of radicalization and laicite is is making for a very interesting mix. Uh, I would say. Many thanks, uh, Nadia. So I will. Uh, follow with a question from Victor Albert, who says, thank you, Nadia. He would like to ask you about the, on the focus uh, on Islamo-leftism or Islamo-gauchism and the process through which our social, social organizations such as the LDH or the UNEF are being defined as enemies of the Republic. Yes. Yes, I mean, I haven't um, done a succinct uh, examination of how this notion of Islamo-Gauchism has, has, has emerged in France and how it has uh, proliferated, right? Because actually I'm not a really, my, my focus is, is mostly Belgium and, uh, and the Francophone field, but of course I follow what's going on in France because it also impacts the, the, the context uh, uh, of Belgium. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, it's quite interesting to see how uh, in the recent year, um, while the notion of Islamo-Kushism was around, um, uh, so it's not a new accusation, uh, today it is, um, it is really, you could say, uh, uh, it has more serious consequences, um, especially since Blanquet has actually also taken a stand uh, on, in that regard, because there has been, a, a, and I'm more familiar also with, uh, uh, with, with what's going on in the universities. I know about uh, when the, 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 uh, the trade unions uh, representative who was also veiled was, uh, uh, was elected that it also triggered a whole uh, outcry. Um, so, so in the universities, there have been uh, recurrent accusations and also uh, attacks uh, on scholars who are um, either, if they are of color, they are accused of promoting communitarism, 
and uh, indigenism. So it's not just Islamo Islamo-Gauchism is actually more an accusation that is uh, addressed towards, um, I would not say just white scholars, but mostly. Um, well, um, uh, scholars of color are often accused of being indigenist. Uh, and that's another accusation that refers, of course, to the indigen uh, de la République. Hein? Uh, which is this uh, group that that uh, uh, that uh, challenges the the racism of France, but does so also by placing it in a continuity with the colonial past, and they are very much considered as a as a state enemy and as a public enemy, and they often see their access to rooms or public speech uh, refused. They have difficulties organizing stuff, so they are very much um, criminalized and, 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 and marginalized in that respect. And so what you often see is that people will, by alliance, be accused, like for instance, Orokaya Diallo will be accused of being an uh, indigenist uh, or a communitarist. Um, and and Islamo-Gauchism um, seems to target people who are uh, not necessarily part of that movement, but who are facilitating the existence of that movement by collaborating with them, by writing positively about them, by um, writing about racism and Islamophobia, by writing about colonial questions. And so these are often also settled academics, huh? uh, established academics. One of them is Eric Fassin, for instance. Uh, who has had to demand police uh, uh, security uh, at his uh, faculty because he was receiving death threats uh, a few weeks ago and very serious uh, death threat. So, um, so it, 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 becomes, it has become much more serious, especially since the Minister of Interior has also described it as a, as a danger to the universities. Thank you, uh, Nadia. I will follow on with a question from Laura Mijares, who says, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, could you please talk about the role Muslim women play within all these debates on radicalization? Uh, she says, so thinking, for example, in the regulation of female bodies, such as the, ve the face veil ban in the Netherlands or Belgium, although the support uh, for the ban has been traditionally attached to the defense of women's rights. Do you think there is a shift uh, towards the prevention of women in danger of being radicalized? So, um, so I see also here different questions. So uh, uh, the role of Muslim women in these debates on radicalization. Um, so how they are both a bit the object of regulation uh, in these policies. Um, and um, and then whether it is also a prevention for women, uh, the danger of women of being radicalized. Now, I think women have actually a very ambivalent <laughs> status. Muslim women have an ambivalent status in this uh, in this uh, whole uh, dispositive, if you want, right? And in the whole public discourse and narrative, because what we've witnessed in the recent years is a shift from uh, the idea of Muslims who need to be saved, eh? and that's a familiar trope, and it is still present. Eh? Now recently, uh, France is also deciding to, um, I mean, the French state has decided to also uh, take more uh, restrictive measures on forced marriages, for instance. I think that's what was announced uh, two days ago, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Polygamy is also still part of the conversation. So in this law against separatism and in these various measures, uh, there is a, also this trope of the Muslim woman who is uh, oppressed and who needs to be saved, right? And that's a familiar trope. But what we also have um, is this other trope of uh, Muslim women who are actually um, sh uh, wolves in sheep clothes, uh, we could call them, right? And that are actually um, not just victims, but that are actually uh, more dangerous uh, than you would think. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, of the Menel uh, uh, affair. Um, what was her name? Menel Iptisem, the singer. I don't know whether you recall that story. So she was uh, a pop singer uh, at, a, at a popular show, The Voice. Uh, I think maybe Spain also has The Voice. Uh, I, every country almost has this uh, popular show, The Voice. And um, so she was very good, very beautiful, but with a headscarf, with a bandana style headscarf. And so, uh, and she was uh, winning actually, and very quickly there was a whole campaign uh, 
around her where they tried to show her real face uh, that she was actually uh, a radical uh, Islamist so that she is not just this beautiful blue eyed uh, angel like uh, face but that behind it there is actually really a radical uh, person and that's a bit the trope that you also find in the decision to ban the, the niqab and the burqa it's not just because it oppresses uh, women but it's also uh, because it is uh, actually seen the women who wear it are really the carriers of of, of political islam right uh, they are really seen as dangerous and so and so we have these different images around uh, muslim women but it's clear and i think it's actually very interesting um, and and i mean that's also one of the questions i i, I think uh, is worth also pursuing and studying and and several colleagues are also doing that to really look at these gendered dimensions of radicalization because obviously there is a very masculine trope that is connected to it huh? the figure of the recruiter but uh, uh, since the deep departure also of, 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 of Muslims to Syria and the gradual uh, uh, understanding that women were not just victims who were going to Syria, but actually also knew what they wanted to do. We call them also the ISIS brides. That's also the reason we don't want to repatriate some of the uh, European women in the camps in Syria because they are radicalized. So there is there is like a whole new discourse around uh, women also being a danger and sometimes even more than than men because they are more cunning they are more uh, you could say manipulative and they 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 they, they seem nice but they're actually uh, dangerous thank you nadia uh, we have seven minutes left so this allows me to ask to tell you the the latest question is from uh, cecilia delgado so Cecilia says the British government is forcing universities to adopt the problematic International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, working definition of anti-Semitism, and they are doing so by Christmas or face government action. There are also some intentions to do so with Islamophobia. Did you see something similar in another European context? What do you think about this as a threat to free speech? And do you think that could help to avoid radicalization discourses? Um, well, I think the, the discussion, I mean, it's an interesting question because I think um, the discussion between uh, the definition of anti-Semitism and the definition of Islamophobia are actually interesting comparative uh, um, yeah, observation points, you could say, because uh, the, the, the issue, I mean, I don't work on the, on the IH our I, uh, a de uh, definition, even though I'm familiar with it, uh, definition, but what I understand uh, is that the issue with this definition is that it tends to, um, to also link, uh, um, you could say, critique on Zionism and uh, Israel also as, and see it as one of the markers of anti-Semitism. And I think so, the pushback is around that component uh, of the definition. But um, in difference to Islamophobia, the whole notion of anti-Semitism is not at question, right? There is a wide acceptance that anti-Semitism is real, that it exists, that it should be defined, that it should be adopted. Now the whole issue is which definition to adopt, right? And 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 the critique on this definition is is is, is the way it connects, you could say, the 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 the, the Israel-Palestine uh, conflicts and the critique um, on Zionism with uh, uh, anti-Semitism. Um, well, in the case of Islamophobia, um, there is already no consensus around Islamophobia. So um, talking about Islamophobia is polemic. And uh, this has also again been illustrated in, in the position of the French state. Um, so there are actually many uh, um, people, intellectuals, influential, uh, intellectuals, people, even academics, who say, "Well, Islamophobia is a, has been invented by the, 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 the by, has been invented by Iran, is a product of uh, political Islam. Uh, it's a way to silence critique uh, on Islam." So, in difference to anti-Semitism, the the use of the term Islamophobia is not accepted. So, in a way, if the government works on Islamophobia, it's actually already often a step forward because it means that they accept 
uh, the term uh, Islamophobia. But um, I'm not familiar with, of course, how it will be defined. Eh? Um, I think that's the second step. I know at the level of the EU, they're still looking for working definition uh, of Islamophobia. So the term has been accepted, but how to define it is the next step. And I think there the challenge is, um, are you going to adopt a, a political uh, um, lecture of Islamophobia that sees it as something that is connected with broader uh, social processes? Or do you uh, understand Islamophobia as simply uh, anti-Muslim hatred and as a, as a question of, of, of yeah, uh, sentiments, basically? And I think those are the questions that are going on, but those are, I would say, typical questions within the anti-racist front. Is racism a matter of prejudice or is racism also, uh, has race, does racism have a political function? And should we talk uh, about racism in a political uh, way? And these are debates you, you also find in the anti-racist uh, field more generally. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia. We have only two minutes to, to resume. So thank you for uh, answering all these questions. I would just add one uh, question, uh, but I think it calls for a, a, a very short answer uh, from you. So all your during all your presentation, you have uh, critically approached the concept of radicalization. So you told us what uh, radicalization is supposed to be according to the authorities. Uh, so my question would be, and I think it's a way to conclude, how should we understand radicalization according to your own perspective? I mean, I, I mean, already, I don't really use the word radicalization. So I think uh, that would be a first start for me. But I think where we could start is, is, uh, is this connection, is uh, when people are somehow, um, I mean, I think one of the things that you often see is a, a loss of trust, right? That people don't trust the institutions anymore, don't trust uh, the governments anymore. Uh, so I think what, for me, the challenge is not to de-radicalize, but the challenge is to restore, to restore uh harm basically because people have been the reason people generally don't trust is because they have been experiencing certain forms of harm whether it's symbolic whether it's material whether it's uh, and so i think what we need to work is on restoration and not on uh, radicalization i would say there could not be uh, a better answer than than yours so uh, again thank you very much uh Nadia Fadil, for your brilliant presentation. Thank you for answering all these questions. Uh, I would like to thank again uh, Isor uh, for organizing this, uh, this conference. It was truly uh, a pleasure to go beyond emotions provoked by terrorist attacks and, and try to, to approach this from a more rational perspective. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Nadia, and to those